Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about cancer clusters in the heavily polluted neighborhoods in the United States and an upcoming protest on September the 20th at the EPA in Washington, D.C. Our guest, Susan Wind, became an environmental advocate after her daughter, Taylor, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in 2017. Through her investigative skill set, she exposed a thyroid cancer cluster in her town along with a dirty secret. Builders, contractors, and landscapers using Duke Energy's coal ash instead of soil as structural fill in communities throughout Lake Norman, North Carolina. The coal ash came from the neighboring coal burning plant, the Marshall Steam Station. While the health department, the state, and the politicians tried to dismiss the issues, Susan Wind continued to build alliances and connections with advocates from all over the country to address the broken system that is failing people's health. Susan Wind, welcome to Talk World Radio. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So can you describe in a little more detail how you personally became a, a, an activist and an advocate uh, on these issues? Uh, well, I having a child, obviously, that um, gets cancer changes a lot of different things for parents across America. And I would have accepted that we were the only one and, you know, just, uh, this happens in life. But when I started getting all of these people talking to me, coming to my door, calling me, finding me on social media, uh, social media, emailing me and telling me all of their family members were getting cancer too, including the pets. I mean, something just wasn't right. So I pretty much wanted to get answers and make sure it was safe for our family to stay there. Um, and that's where I guess you could say mama bear came into play and I just started doing my own investigative work. Fortunately, I had a background in doing investigative work for decades. So I educated myself really quickly on what was in our environment and what I might need to do to figure this out and who I needed to speak to. And that's what I, I did. I spent 12 hours a day, seven days a week doing for a couple of years. And, and you had to, to raise funds to do the research, mm -hmm. to find out what the problem was, how many people had cancer in just mm -hmm. your town, right? Yeah, it was, it was you know, again, this is, was all new for me. And now what I know, I want everybody to know um, this is the norm and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. But yeah, I had to, people told me we have no money. We don't know what's wrong. Everything's safe. So I had to go out while taking care of my daughter during her first round of cancer. I had to raise money to find some chemist who would test the water soil, like would try to do something we needed. To, I had no idea what it could be. So um, yeah, I had to raise money. The first round I raised about $109,000 doing a 5k and people came out and donated and I had sponsors come out. Um, and then I had to hand that money over to chemists who were like, we'll try to help you and see what's wrong. And I learned really quick, $100,000 doesn't go a long way with doing any environmental studies. You need millions to do true environmental studies. But I didn't know that going into this. Yeah. And, and how did it become known what the what the root of the problem was that that people were using coal ash instead of soil? Sure. So, well, we didn't know what the root of the problem is, but we did find one of the roots of the problem was we had a thyroid cancer cluster for years in that zip code that nobody knew about. So that was something very frustrating that why we have health departments that collect all this data and do nothing with the data. And I had to pay people pretty much through my fundraising to find that out because they weren't going to be transparent with a citizen like myself. So that was the first thing we found out. Um, but it wasn't just thyroid cancer. I mean, that was my whole ad advocacy work because I, my daughter had thyroid cancer, but it was a lot of cancers. And um, again, we weren't sure what it could be. And we still 
can't say this caused these cancers, but through my investigative work and digging up documents for decades and interviewing people and people were coming to me, they started telling me because I wasn't from that area when they started building. It was, it was it's a huge, beautiful area. It's very affluent. Um, and the building boom, I didn't live there when they started in the early nineties, I came in later, but people started educating me and telling me and showing me all kinds of evidence that, yeah, you know, they use coal ash instead of soil. And I was like, what's coal ash? So I started educating myself, speaking with another chemist who's an expert on coal ash, other scientists across the country. And I said, is this dangerous? And they were like, yeah. This is loaded with heavy metals that are all linked to different types of cancers. Even on the EPA's website, it says, if you live within um, so many miles of a cold dump, you have a one in 50 chance of getting cancer. Talks about inhalation as with dust and then uh, ingestion with water. So when I started learning, like, I've got this all over the place. And then I started digging up documents going back to the 90s where it showed that the utility company and the state pretty much were working out a draft on how they could use this as soil. And it shows how they tried to hide it. They didn't want to record the records. It showed, I mean, there's evidence in these letters that said, this could be an environmental problem. This could be, you know, people knew this could blow up someday and it's all right there. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned and, uh, the, the EPA. There are people around the country who don't ask me why. Imagine that the EPA would ride into the rescue in a case like this. Uh, not exactly what happened, is it? No, no. Um, and, you know, you, they tell you, okay, start with your locals. Go to your local politicians. Work your way up to the state, to the feds. Like, this is how you're supposed to do it if you're just an ordinary citizen like me. And I learned really quick that everybody is just more comfortable being quiet and not saying anything because their jobs are riding on it, their positions are riding on it. Um, politicians on both sides of the aisle, I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat, they both are not gonna fight for the people if they could potentially lose their seat. Also, I learned how much money that the politicians take from the polluters. So they're not gonna bite the hand that feeds them anyway. So I was dismissed, I, I mean, pretty much I was, fed a bunch of BS for a while. And, and I saw the writing on the wall and then just being dismissed. The excuses, the, um, it, it was just, it was so disgusting on so many levels. But yeah, EPA, when I spoke with them, um, this, they're like, coal ash is fine, you're fine, it's beneficial fill. And that's how the EPA classifies so many of these different carcinogens and toxins as beneficial fill. Well, who is it benefiting? The industry? or the people that are all living among it and getting sick. And the part I have a problem with is you need to disclose all of this, everything, instead of just blindsiding people left and right. Give us a choice. If I wanted to move to an area that thought it would be okay to use this as soil. Yeah. EPA used to come here in rural Virginia and tell people you could eat sewage sludge with a spoon, go ahead and put it on your farms. You know, that this seems to be the EPA's role mm -hmm. to be the authoritative voice for uh, everything is OK. Go ahead and poison mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and, and now so now that through the work of yourself and others, this is public and exposed. They're giving them years and years to clean it up while people continue to get cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much the sweetheart deals that they make um, with all of this, the announcements that come out. Uh, yeah, we're all going to be pretty much sick. The next generation is going to pay for this worse than we are. It's going to, it's not going to get any better. This should be a priority. It should be immediate, and it's, it never is. And, um, and, you know. I sat there and racked my brain for a long time. Like, I'm like, and we ended up moving out of the area. I saw the writing on the wall. There was going to be, they weren't going to address this. They were not going to do proper studies, more studies, test this. They weren't going to do it. I saw how they tried to sabotage what I did. Okay. I was even used by people. Saw the writing on the wall. So we moved. I had other children, a dog that got cancer. I was not sticking around another day. So we had to pick up and move, you know, and that's, I'll do anything for my kids to be safe. 
And that was a lot to move a family that we loved our area. We grew up there. Um, and I also got a lot of backlash because people, as you know, if they didn't get sick, they were like, there's nothing wrong here. You're going to hurt my property values. You're, you know, I, I got a lot. I was bullied. Um, I mean, I had a lot I had to deal with as well. So I'm like, forget it. I, I'm not going to sit around and do this. So we moved and I had a lot of information and knowledge and I connected with hundreds of communities across America who had pretty much the same type of story I did. But then it was just getting bigger and bigger by the month of, it, it wasn't just coal ash and North Carolina. I mean, it was oil and gas spills and disbursements. And it was jet fuel that people in Hawaii were drinking over the past year. It was all the military bases, the Superfund sites. It was PFAS. It was phosphate mining. I and mean, we can go down the list, right? And I start like hearing one person's story after another. Flint, Michigan is another good example. And how every single story is the same. It's people have to die and get sick, a lot of them being kids. And then we try to figure it out, not because we have an agenda. We're not getting paid to do this because we don't want this to happen to anyone else. And we get attacked and we get dismissed and we get told it's safe. It's safe. And, and same story, even the firefighters, which I learned so much about this past year, the gear they're wearing contains contaminants and they're going down with cancers from their gear yeah. more dangerous than their actual job which is to protect people when there are emergencies so i came with all these people and i said nothing's going to change in my lifetime in the next lifetime even these organizations all over that are doing great grassroots initiative work they're not going it, to it's not going to change something i'm like this entire system is completely broken and we all need to come together and as you know you have to come together like this to to get any type of attention. Absolutely. How how unusual, as you found these stories and cancer clusters all over the United States, how unusual is it for it to be a, a fairly well-off neighborhood like yours? Is it typically poor neighborhoods or or is it sort of yeah. random? It's so that's a great um question. So it, it happens to all basically socioeconomic areas. Um, the difference is we do see a lot more industry overall polluting in lower income areas and rural areas. So we definitely see that's so much environmental injustice. So we do see more of the industry dumping the lands and the landfills and taking in the, the sewage sludge or the coal ash or you know, the, the waste in these areas, these towns where they know people aren't going to have the voice to fight. But it does happen. I mean, we have a group in California, all these um, families are living in these neighborhoods where they did, it's, there's a group called Parents um, Fighting the Santa Susana Field Lab. And this is where they did testing decades and decades and uh, decades ago. And this radioactive um, carcinogens are now coming into these neighborhoods and kids are getting cancers. And we have another neighborhood in Indiana. Again, this is neighborhoods and schools that um, there was um, contamination in the water and the plumes, a lot of vapor intrusions, all kinds of stuff. So we see this in all different types of neighborhoods. The difference is, uh, from my experience living where I lived, is I can move. I can pick up and move. And when this happens all over these areas that are more um, rural or lower income and people spent decades and family generations living there, they can't move. And, and that's where, you know, I have a bigger problem with like, they can't get up and move. They're, they're stuck. Yeah. And it, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's not fair, you know, I guess. So I look at, okay, my story, you know, I could pick up and move. And, and that's, I guess, better, but I don't think it's fair that people are stuck. I couldn't agree more. We're speaking with Susan Wind, uh, and you're planning a protest in Washington, D.C. about this with a lot of other people. There's a website, safeprotestepa.org. Can you tell us uh, what's planned and who's involved? Sure. So we have connected with hundreds of groups across America. And we are all going to be meeting at Freedom Plaza at nine in the morning. 
we have speakers lined up. Those will be on our website this weekend um, that represent different um, areas of the country and different poisons, as you want to say, um, different people who are speaking on behalf of uh, nuclear fallouts, oil and gas spills, coal ash, PFAS, firefighters, environmental injustice, um, people, scientists, attorney, environmental attorneys. I tried to, you know, we have all different people coming and we will be marching after um, our speakers to the EPA headquarters. And I think having all of this evidence together, you can't dismiss like and say, well, this was just one area and this is how we addressed it. We fixed this. This is just one town. This is just one person. Like, no, we're hand delivering you evidence of all these different contaminants, all these different towns, and all of the same failures and problems of the broken system. And I also might add, it's not just the EPA. The EPA is the nucleus, okay? And while the intentions were great of establishing the EPA in 1970, it's been hijacked and handcuffed by the polluters. So this is Congress's fault too, both parties, because they are in this just as deep this is a problem with the CDC. It's a problem with the Department of Human Health Services because the way they deal with health data and studies allows these corporations to get away with this and all the loopholes that we have to try to jump through. So this is a massive broken system, just to make that clear. But the EPA, because they are the ones supposedly supposed to protect the environment, they have a big hand in this. Not to mention, uh, well, many other things you could add, but a little building across the river called the Pentagon that's responsible for a lot of the PFAS contam contamination around the world, including communities yeah. where people are denied any rights, even to investigate, even if they hold 5Ks and raise the money, because the, the place doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the Pentagon. Oh, yeah. The Department of Defense is one of the largest polluters in this country, and that's also... Um, you know, you've heard of Camp Lejeune. They just finally got some type of justice for that. And you've heard of the PACT Act with all the burn pits. But the DOD, um, and like this, and that's all disgusting. That's how we treat our troops and their families by polluting areas and then leaving it and not even addressing to clean it up. And these poor people are sick, going through a lifetime of illnesses, dying, cancers, watching people get sick. And then you have the VA, which is another hot mess in this country. So, I mean, literally we can show that the system fails and hoping this is just the beginning of a movement, hoping people come out to show you have a big mess. This is a national health crisis and a national contamination crisis on your hand, not just one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we need to, after this, because this isn't going away, we need to empower people and get on the community levels and help people. Because what are they supposed to do when the system isn't helping them? It, it's, it doesn't surprise me that they ignore the vast majority of the burn pit victims because they're the people who live in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And it doesn't surprise me that they get away with poisoning people in scattered communities around the United States because it's such a big job to organize and protest as you're doing. But the military troops, uh, including quite likely the, the former son of the U.S. president, who are given cancer by these burn pits, even this group of people who are so promoted uh, by the Congress and in the media, they had to struggle for years and years and do everything imaginable to get a little bit of, of compensation. Uh, what is it going to take to get compensation for all of the communities around the country if that sort of enormous effort is needed uh, just for military veterans? Yeah, it's a great question. It's just, and that's, listen, I shouldn't even be here. I shouldn't even be doing and organizing a protest. I shouldn't even have had to spend all my time raising funds. I should not have had any of this. None of us should. And the system, and if anything I can do to educate the new generations coming in, because I wish I would have known a lot of this when I was out of college, younger, I would have done th things differently. I would have done things at least to help protect my family better when it comes to the environment, right? And we're at a point where 
we need to disclose all of this for everybody. People need to, to know instead of being blindsided. People need to be held accountable. Maybe there are more attorneys out there because this is a human rights violation. It's not just an environmental uh, fight. This is a human rights violation because when people can't get clean air, water, or soil, and uh, there's a problem. And you're seeing this unfold in Jackson, Mississippi this past couple years. This wasn't just the first time they've had bad water, but people don't really think it's a problem until it happens to them. So trust me, more people are going to keep getting blindsided with cancer because since I got blindsided five years ago, there's a bunch of stories right behind me. And we're just going to keep on adding on these stories until somebody wakes up and says, yeah, this system doesn't work. What, what can people do who want to help either to, to be in D.C. on September 20th, be in Freedom Plaza at 9 o'clock, or, or contribute in other ways from other uh, locations? We, we want as many people um, as we can to come out, um, to you know, just to show your support. It's a peaceful movement. Um, and also with, um, again, and we've been doing this all on our own all year, so... Um, more to come after this, but uh, we've connected with thousands of people. We want to hear their stories, connect with their groups, their organizations, and our website is available. Like, get on board. We need, I think we need a national almost database that really portrays all these different problems across America with different layers of all the um, areas that are threats. And uh, we have to do this because the health department's not going to do it for you. And the government's not going to do it for you. And maybe if we start putting all of this data um, across on, in a, on um, a national database, you know, maybe the local people will care more when they have to disclose this and uh, people know what they're moving into. It, it seems like for every protest we have of the things that cause cancer, we must have 10,000 uh, pink beribboned 5Ks and half marathons to fight cancer and cure cancer uh, after it's created. Is, is, are, are these the, the ideal priorities? Is, is, should we maybe be putting a little bit more into not creating it? Right. So uh, I agree with you. I think most, even the cancer moonshot, while it has great intentions, what they wanted to do to reduce cancer deaths in the next 50 years, it's not going to happen. So all the money is put into curing cancers and medication and trial studies, which is important. And I never downplay because you want to save every single person that gets a cancer diagnosis. However, they don't put any effort into preventing cancer, okay? Okay. And why? Because there is no incentive. There is no incentive when you start putting in studies and money to show, hey, this causes cancer, this causes cancer, because you're going to put industries out of business, you're going to impact um, the wallets and money. So there's no incentive to do any type of emergency studies on all these contaminants. And if you look at Europe, they make sure there are independent studies done on contaminants before they roll those out in the environment. We, the United States, we do it the opposite. We trust the paid science that the corporations bring to our government, and we pretty much say, well, we don't know much, so we'll let it happen, and then we are the guinea pigs and pay for it. We saw this, and we never learn our lesson. This happened with 9-11, happened with Three Mile Island. We never learn our lesson. We just keep doing this over and over. I mean, and the money that this country spends on so much, why they don't spend it on immediate, real cleanup, health studies, medical monitoring for the damage they did is just not American. It's horrible. Those, uh, those other countries provide everyone with health care. Uh, so there is some financial reason to reduce the costs of health care uh, in those other countries, right? We don't have that. Uh, that motivation uh, in the U.S. government. Um, what are what are what is the? I noticed on the website, which again is safeprotestepa.org, uh, a video of a firefighter. What are, are a lot of firefighters coming? What role are firefighters and their organizations playing in this? So the head of the firefighter union is General President Ed Kelly. And he pretty much 
is he's been a firefighter for a long time and he um, is new to his role, I believe, over the last two years. I could have that date wrong, but no, pretty new. And one of his priorities is making sure that these firefighters are safe. And so he has gotten behind this. Um, he will be one of our speakers and um, a lot of firefighters hopefully will get behind him because as a leader, you know, he wants to make sure that their gear is safe um, so they are protected properly. And here we have firefighters having to fight the system to say, please don't poison us. I mean, it's just, I don't know how low we can go at this point with between every single human being matters. But when you throw military, firefighters, children, I mean, I, I don't even know anymore what to say. And that's why I was so upset over the past year. And I'm like, we need to do something. This is not working. And, and, you know, I care about families that get a cancer diagnosis, whether it's a child, whether it's their spouse, you know, it shouldn't have to be that way. And it's, you know, they want to say forever, oh, it's genetic. It's genetic. It's genetic. No, it's not genetic. No, no more coincidences anymore. Yeah. What's, what's in the firefighters uniforms? Is it PFAS? There's yeah. well, and then the scary thing about PFAS because there was a new announcement by this EPA saying that now they're going to classify two um, of these chemicals, PFAS, as hazardous. That's like the new big news that came out last week. But the problem is there's thousands of chemicals that have replaced the word, you know, PFAS. So Dupont, going back, was exposed years and years ago. Rob Balot was he broke this open, and They've had time and other manufacturers to say, okay, we need to just, basically we're going to make something similar, but call it something else so we don't have to deal with this. And now there are thousands of chemicals out there already um, that have just replaced PFAS. So, uh, so they're going to regulate and, and again, some because, of them and not the other ones. Right. And again, our system allows it. Um, the corporations pretty much dictate what goes in. Uh, our environment. Incredible. Um, we've been speaking with Susan Wind. Uh, you can go to the website safeprotestepa.org. Uh, and if you can be in Washington, D.C. on September 20th, you can be in Freedom Plaza at 9 a.m. Uh, I think about 11 years ago, Susan, a lot of us were living in, in Freedom Plaza in, in tents and uh, saying we are going to occupy the place until we get what we want. I, I highly recommend it uh, if uh, if people have the time to stick around. Um, uh, Susan, just uh, under a minute left, uh, anything you want to say to people who, uh, who, for the most part, obviously uh, care and don't want uh, cancer being created all over this country? Um, I, I just, again, I... I think everybody, it doesn't matter um, who we are, where we're from, our views, anything. I think all of us know that cancer does not discriminate and it could happen to any of us. And if there's something we can do to make a difference so our children and their children, the future generations don't have to pay for this, decades and decades of contamination and cancers getting worse. Um, this is, the only way is we coming together because at the rate we're going, nothing is going to change. And so I just hope we get a great turnout. Um, I hope, um, you know, I'm glad to connect with so many different people out there who care and it, uh, it's, a, it's really overwhelming. So. Well, thank you for what you're doing, Susan Wind and everybody try to be there. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.